Hello, I'm Nick Holland, Global Head of Research with Money 2020, and welcome to Money 2020 Hindsight. Today we're going to discuss Coinbase's SEC struggles, Welsh landfills, robot dogs, and of course the money shot. Pew pew. Um, but first, as ever, let's start with the number of the day with uh, Mickey Tesfire. Mickey, over to you, mate. Hey, Nick. Nice to see you. Uh, and my number of the day today is 100 million. Ooh, 100 million what? 100 million users. Uh, so that, yeah, that number is the projected number of uh, US consumers who are uh, expected to use their smartphones to scan QR codes, to make payments, look up uh, restaurant menus, uh, look up details at retail stores, etc. by 2025. Okay. Uh, and that's, I mean, clearly it was interesting, right? Because obviously QR codes were seen to be on the, on the way out for uh, the pandemic. They were kind of I um, think someone, some journalist coined the term digital vomit in terms of them just appearing on sort of marketing like collateral and cans of beans and things with no real reason. Uh, and then clearly a pandemic came. It seemed like a very good way to uh, actually get people to connect to menus. So um, looking through the stats here, I mean, obviously a huge rise in, uh, you know, sort of 2022 to 2025. They're looking at jumping in from 83.4 million to 99.5 million I mean, it's just huge, really. So the A to QR code's coming back. Yeah, I mean, the numbers are pretty, pretty significant. I guess um, it's also probably something that we've seen take off so much in East Asia, right? And then now it's, it looks like it's finally kind of coming yeah. to... to they mentioned as well, I mean, it's there's a lot of, I guess, scope as well for QR codes being the connective tissue with things like... Uh, TV commerce, where you've got it on vehicle screens or interactive TVs or a whole variety of places now. So I think, you know, once the muscle memory is there, um, you know, clearly people are going to use it. So, um, yeah. well done. Yeah, Yate, Yate QR codes that have managed to... The, the QR codes, yeah. What a resurrection story. I know. It's, yes, like Lazarus. Anyway, <laughs> moving on, let's talk about... Um, Coinbase. Uh, Coinbase just can't seem to catch a break these days. So I'll, I'll do the, the skinny on what they've been up to or what's happened to them. So the SEC, the US Securities and Exchange Commission, has launched an investigation to whether Coinbase let consumers trade digital assets that should have been registered as securities. So apparently the Department of Justice um, has some separate... Oh, the, the SEC charges that there were uh, 25 crypto assets, um, with which nine were securities, said a statement from the watchdog. Uh, Coinbase's response from this, from their chief legal officer, Paul Grewal, uh, was Coinbase does not list securities, end of story. But I mean, again, Mickey, it doesn't seem like Coinbase is catching a break here. I mean, they've, they've had it um, a bit tough since, like I said, Brian Armstrong a few months ago uh, said the quite a bit out loud, which is that your money is potentially not safe in the case of bankruptcy. So it's not been uh, much of a joyride for them the last few months. Yeah, I mean, they've had quite, they've had a number of issues, haven't they? I guess I think... So this one today is there's probably two there's two separate stories in there. The first is about just Coinbase as a crypto exchange and, and, and what it lists, as you said, regarding whether or not it's listing securities. And then the second is a separate issue that is facing around a former employee who's been charged with insider trading. And I guess in my mind that kind of makes it a bit worse, doesn't it? Because it's a bit of bad behavior in the culture as well as some of the kind of like wider regulatory issues. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's issues on all sides, at, it seems, at the moment with Coinbase. And then back again to the, the perennial discussion of whether these are assets or securities or what is what is a cryptocurrency and it's still, you know, it, 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 one jurisdiction might say it's an asset, another one might, might be completely separate. So it's, you know, again, that gray area is still a problem. Um, yeah. And I think that's a big issue, really, because yeah. I, it's, it's like you have no... To, to my mind, sometimes I'm not sure what the point of these conversations are, because it seems like they're doing a bit of work to patch up something while the, the rest of the building is falling down. Yeah. Um, so while we're on the topic of crypto, and before we move on to the money shot, pew pew, um, I feel so bad for this guy. He's, he's like the poster child of Schadenfreude, right? I mean, it's the, the poor guy, James Howells, who was a former IT worker in Wales. He threw away his hard drive into a landfill in 2013. It's now what? 
<laughs> for nearly a decade on, he's still trying to get hold of this. So he's, he's proposing, I mean, it's understandable. I mean, the current rate for 8,000 Bitcoins is about 176 million, even with Bitcoin being where it is today. Um, you know, he, he's, he threw it out and he's now got this $11 million business plan, which is to get the Newport City Council on board to dig through 11,000 or, sorry, 110,000 tons of trash over three years. Um, he's also got, he's got Richard Hammond from Top Gear involved in this in terms of publicizing it. He's buying robot dogs from, you know, Boston Dynamics. And it, I just like, you know, I just feel really bad for him. I mean, particularly because the, the local government's response was that he could present or say nothing which would convince them to go along with a plan citing ecological risks. So, I mean, he's, he, he, again, like I say, I just feel so terrible for this man who, I mean, this would be a life chat. I mean, just kind of wonder as well, if he did find the hard drive, it's been in a landfill for like, again, 10 years almost. It's not It's not going to be, I don't know, is it, is it even salvageable? It's, you know, it's... Yeah, I mean... I have so many questions and I don't I don't know if there's gonna be even any answers. I mean I, I guess fair play to him because wow, he's been really at this nine years. Uh and I do I like you said, I feel so bad for him because I guess hundred and seventy six million dollars eating up away is yeah, that's would, enough to keep most people up away. It would be a nice life away from Newport, Wales, I guess, potentially. So I mean it's anyway. Uh, I, I'm wondering what his next plan is going to be. It's, you know, anyway, um, good luck to you, uh, Mr. Howells. But um, again, it's like a, a Sisyphean task or whatever. So it's, good luck. Anyway, uh, we are over <clears throat> onto our next section. Uh, but let's let's talk about the the money shop. Pew pew. Um, so today's segment of the Money Shop, we are bringing in Gina Clark, who is the Europe Content Director for Money 2020. Gina, please unmute yourself and join the conversation. As if by magic, I appear. Hello, everyone. That is beautiful. Look at that. So we just mentioned, <laughs> we, cha we changed the backgrounds. It was very dark before, so I looked like a disembodied head. And now I'm just this sort of T-shirt with eyes that floats around. Let's talk about, and this is fascinating because, well, and again, you can provide your lens on this, Gina, because you're in Europe and I'm not. Uh, mm. But according to some recent data from research from Global Data, uh, Europe's the fastest growing region for fintech hiring amongst tech industry companies in the three months ending May. So the number of roles in Europe made up 25.8% of total fintech jobs, which is up from 11.3% in the same quarter last year. This was followed by South and Central America, which saw a 0.6 year on year percentage point change in fintech roles. Um, it, good news, right? So, you know, Gina, let's unpack this a little bit. Uh, yay, fintech. Absolutely. I mean, we knew that London was a hub that has that amazing sort of trifecta of investment with banks and then talent as well with the universities. But it's great to see that that's spreading throughout Europe. And out of that, my favourite was Poland, which jumped from 0% to 5%. So, <laughs> you know, I think there's a home um, all around Europe for fintech jobs. And it's nice to see yeah. Portugal's on the list. And, you know, there's, um, there's a lot more to come, I think. Uh, we're not quite in the US state yet but we're getting there definitely well, well i thought i mean what was interesting as well i mean we're, we're not long back i mean it still it seems like months even years away that we were all in amsterdam uh and but i mean the there were clearly sort of fintech areas or companies that had really big presence there but there was representation from you know i think every country had like sort of the lithuania village and you know there was uh, again, I met some fascinating folk from Estonia that really into sort of Web3 development, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, again, I think there's, you know, we think about Europe or maybe it gets misrepresented as, you know, I think maybe sort of London sucking all the air out of the room, but there's so much going on in other regions. So, you know, um, you know I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. And I think a big part of that is probably the displacement from Ukraine as well. And obviously this only data only goes up till May. But what you'll find is that actually there are quite a few well-known software hubs in Europe um, that feed into the tech streams across the world. And I think with those uh, displacements in Ukraine happening, they've had to set up elsewhere. So you'll probably see, um, I think we'll see a stronger uh, second quarter definitely when it comes to that. And it's encouraging. I think, um, you know, as, as kind of 
more um i was looking at kind of like the digital passport options and everything from israel and i think as more digital equivalents come online we'll see this big spread um you know it's not just about homeworking it's about what comes with it what are the benefits yeah. of the worker if they're working remotely and that's that's only on the up i'd say yeah i mean I, there was a panel that i was on i can't well, I, I can divulge some of the details. It was in the exchange, but you know, there was a panel in, uh, that was discussing uh, again bringing in workers from other uh, areas, and there was a guy talking about him hiring a, a whole team from Kazakhstan. You know, there was because uh, because you can now. You know, again, it's that sort of this the ability to source employees globally and the ability to work from home and having the resources you know to be able to do that. You can get world class anyone um you know for, so your, your uh catchment area for the jobs is no, le no longer anywhere locally or even you know at a country level it could be far broader than that mickey what about you i mean, and I mean the next... sorry. sorry i'm but in i would I'd just add to that and say the next question is you need we need to start sort of um looking at salaries versus geographies because why buy into the ivy league is as you say you can get a similar equivalent from kazakhstan so that would be the the next segue i think yeah Mickey, I mean, you're obviously a global citizen in terms of your travels and, and so on and so forth. I mean, you're, you're, you are working for us in, in London. But, you know, again, it's funny. I mean, we, we are all virtual right now, obviously. But, you know, you've, you've probably sort of hands on seen some of the uh, changes happening in, in fintech and particularly for sort of global hiring practices. Yeah, I mean, I think um, what I would point to, I think Gina and both of you two made a really good point. I think the remote thing has had a big impact. And I think now to, you know, when we're seeing the cost of living go up, that probably reflects on companies too, right? The, yeah. In big cities, the kind of salaries you're going to have to pay. And then the competition in those cities with banks or with other players, I think that means you're going to probably start looking at places a bit outside I think Eastern Europe I think for a long time places like Estonia and Lithuania I think they've made a, a really concerted effort to get a lot of fintech going on right so they had a lot of really streamlined processes for getting companies registered there so you had big players like Google the like who do their payments licensing out of those regions and I think that builds it into a hub slowly in terms of yeah. attracting the talent so I think we'll see more of this going yeah. forward. I think as Gina said as well, there's this sort of the talent from Ukraine that is permeating Europe uh, will will again, you know, clearly make a big difference in terms of the the, sort of the presence of fintech and developments across again the, the entire region. So it's all again, I yeah. think all net positive. I mean, I think I mean again, it, one of the stats the reports mentioned is the, the United States is still kind of the you know, where all this got the, the majority of the fintech jobs advertised, 33.5% more jobs in the three months ending May. But again, it, it is shifting again back to this sort of global diaspora. -like it effect. went down from 50%. So, you know, where's where, who's going to get that extra 20, 25% and hopefully Europe. But of course, uh, strong competition as well with um, Asia coming in and uh sectors as well um so. I've heard the vatican's bringing out a uh, payment system called uh paypal mm -hmm. love it <laughs> oh you crack myself up anyway uh, um, someone has to someone has to nick <laughs> all right so with that thanks so much everybody um mickey as always for being my wingman on these it's been you know great on this one as well uh Gina Clark, thank you so much for your time and insights. Um, I'm Nick Holland for Money 2020 and see you soon. Bye for now.